welcome everybody. I'm very happy to see you. New faces, old faces, very much <laughs> old faces. And since I usually forget it, I'm going to start with everything that I should have said last time and totally forgot to say, which is that the National Danish Book Club and Literary Event, and I'm reading off my cheat sheet here, is a collaboration of Museum of Danish America, Northwest Danish Association, and <clears throat> Desiree, my colleague whom you can see up there, and me. We are being made possible with support from the Scan Design Foundation in Seattle, the Danish American Heritage Society, and the University of Washington Scandinavian Studies Department. Finally, we also have promotional partners and they include the National Foundation for Danish America, Ilvahoy Museum in Solman in uh, California and the National Nordic Museum in Seattle. So now I remember to say it and I'm very happy and I'm very happy to see you all here tonight to discuss a very short book. Mm -hmm. I was thinking really a lot about the pandemic when I was reading the book, because for me, it's very much about hiding behind a mask. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for the past two and a half years, we've all been hiding more or less behind the mask and not really looking at ourselves in the mirror, even the mirror, if it exists or whether it doesn't exist. But those were some of the thoughts that this book spurred on. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts were, and I don't know if that shows my age, but that's okay. I just lost my place here. Uh, Paul Simon from Simon and Garfunkel. Do you know one of his wonderful songs called I'm a Rock, I'm an Island? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you never loved, you never would have cried. I'm a rock, I'm an island. Mm -hmm. That's from one of the stanzas, banal but true. And the last kind of banality is none other than Janis Joplin. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. So we could keep on sharing our memories of famous rock singers. This is of course from me and Bobby McGee, but they all have a little bit, a grain of what we find in this book. And I gave you a ton of questions that I found very interesting. We are a wide variety of ages here, happily, and that makes me very, very glad because then we'll have different perspectives on these questions. But I do want to start out reading as I usually do, and in my Kindle version in Danish, it's in page 14, so you'll have to um, just take, take my literal translation here, where he says our protagonist, the he, the nameless psychiatrist he, after a really long and totally insignificant day at the office, I fell asleep early in my chair, gently uh, rocked by his slow playing on the other side of the kind of walls that separate, but also bring proximity. And I thought that image with the wall that separates, that is repeated several times through the book was a really interesting place to start because you might argue, and I do hope you've enjoyed and watched Desiree's absolutely marvelous interview with the author. There's so many aspects you might enjoy, but I thought one of the things that I really enjoyed was how you can be really close to people and yet not see them, not be seen, and not have any kind of relationship to anybody else. So that's why I started my first question saying, is the gist of this recognizable? And it also referred to the fact that he starts counting down to his retirement that is six months down the road. Is it possible? Is it recognizable? Is this something that also rings bells with you? So as you know, it's usually a very open discussion, but if you wanted to start there, that's fine. If you want to start with something else, that's also. Yes, Stephen. I'm, I'm only into retirement just a few years. And this idea of counting down to the last day 
is still fresh in my mind. So yeah. I can certainly relate to that. And how did you feel about it? Did you have the same kind of vacillations, hesitancies that he did, or joy, or indifference? Uh, well, there's especially with we guys that your job, your career has a lot of identity. Mm -hmm. So to give that up is like, okay, what am I going to be when I'm not in the work? So uh, of course, my my wife would not have ever allowed me to have nothing planned for retirement. So I already had some things set up and had been, because I had gone without hobbies. So I had to develop some things to, to do. So I was not going to sit on the couch and watch TV all day. So, <laughs> so I, I could not identify with his not having anything in his life to look forward to after work. He has one thing to look forward to. He makes good tea. Hmm. Ooh, so so how does that fill up your day what do you think and may i jump to the end of the book do you think he actually retires no no not at all no i think he he dies in harness so to speak he just he yeah. keeps working till he's till he dies that's it which i think is good for him actually yeah. in this context so yeah, that was my my thought is this is such an abrupt end. And it's like, OK, did he follow her into the, the cafe? Did he not? Did he retire? So many questions. I guess well, he's I setting, thought, setting I up he for opened a, door. Yeah, when she opens the door. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I could have she could have a sequel to this. <laughs> well, that's no. as I asked her. Uh, she has actually been encouraged to write a sequel, but nah, she says it's done. Any yeah. other reactions to that? How do you think it ends? Does he retire? Does he follow her? What happens? Do they start an affair? Yes. Sandra? Yeah, oh, I, was always yeah I think so. He started living again. You know, he kind of was winding down from living. And, and all of a sudden... His, you know, he smelled the perfume, all the apples and the cinnamon, and, and he started sensing and feeling and living again. I thought the ending was very optimistic, I suppose, in a way that he became engaged. He, he as you were saying, he became engaged with life again. Mm -hmm. And uh, wasn't he going to take another patient towards the end? Mm -hmm. They put it in there. So... I don't think he retired. Of course, it's all very much a conjecture, but it seemed at the end that he was following her in and opening up a new page and perhaps having a some kind of a relationship. With but her. Linda, when you say optimistic, do you mean overly optimistic? Well, in his mind's eye, he was uh, hoping for something. I don't know. Her... She, her, her uh, mental health problems seem to be the sort that it would never be smooth sailing. Weren't, but, they, um, weren't they about 40 years difference in age? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I was assuming that he did go into the cafe and um, yeah. I was hoping that they would, I think she had kind of gone through the process and she seemed on very solid ground. So I was hoping they potentially would just become friends and, um, I also was really loving the scene where he went and got the ingredients and made the cake for his neighbor. Yeah, and that, um, that was, that was really lovely. And to your, to your, uh, conversation that about walls, I found that just so poignant that, um, you know, he had felt the rhythm of this life. And, um, it was interesting because the first little, you know, there were some horrible, windows into his soul in the first few chapters when he's counting down hope you know if someone's ill oh good then I have even fewer but then when he actually talked about his neighbor the first time he said once I didn't hear him and gosh I thought I might have to go over which actually did show a little glimmer of humanity early on but I loved how that came full circle to him bringing bringing the cake now I have a question um because the whole thing kind of really bothered me, the literary device of setting this in 1948 in France, in Paris, with some references to 1935, 
and I, I didn't, I didn't, to me, that wasn't successful. There was really, to me, no flavor of Paris. It could have been anywhere. And I was just wondering, and nobody, the, the war never came into it. This is post-war Paris, where there was all kinds of austerity before that. And she's German, apparently married to a Frenchman. And yet, you know where it's set and you know the time frame. but I didn't get any flavor of either the, the place or the time. And I, I unfortunately did not know there was an interview because I, I would have watched it, but why did she pick that particular time and place? That really bothered me. That is wonderful. Uh, and I think that's Ray should answer that because yes. that was one of the questions in the interview. Oh. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I asked her about that because, I mean, it's pretty obvious, right, the Germans and the French people and and I was like touching on how like we associate French people with like um, uh, like um, emotions and uh, like l'amour and uh, the Germans with being more like stereotypical by the book and more like mm. schematic maybe in their heads and they are reversed and I, I asked her what to read into that and she was like she knew she kind of wanted it to be take to the, the whole narrative to to take place during the war, but she didn't really want to touch on it, and she hadn't thought about um, like those connections. She said, but she did explain that um, in her own life early on, she did live in Paris, and while as she was writing this book, she, those images came to mind and just popped out and she felt at home in that <laughs> setting and around those streets. So that's as much as I could get away from that. Do you have anything you wanna add, Nina? Yeah, no, but because I think that the main point was she was not writing a book about the war. If you will be metaphorical, you can say she's writing a war, you know, an internal war in the persons both in Agatha and our protagonist, uh, psychiatrist, but it's definitely not anything to do with the reality that's surrounding them. I, you could say that maybe the most poignant part of the reality is the cafeteria. And the cafeteria is a place of refuge. It's kind of a safe place. So that's where I see the outer world, ex well, extending into their lives. But otherwise I think it's all inner. Uh, the mm. inner call. Right. There was a lot of chatter online uh, complaining about them not bringing up the war. And, uh, you know, if you're living at that time in Paris, why don't we have some feeling about Paris? But as I was reading that chatter, I kept thinking this isn't about the external world. This is about mm. what's going on inside people and how getting to what is happening inside a person is a very difficult task. And so the job that this man had is the person who was supposed to be able to do that. And yet mm. he was probably the most closed off person in the book. Yeah. So I, I don't see that the external world had a whole lot to do with this story. Yeah. No, but my point was that she- Can I say, just, Susan, uh, just a sec. Yeah. When you want to say something, you can raise your hand or you can click on the hand down in the chat or you can just yeah. talk. Of course, I just wanted to say that it's fine as long as we can all say something. Susan. Yeah, um, it, it, my point was that she picked a particular time and place. She picked 1948, probably have to realize that at least some of her readers would refer back. I mean, why didn't she pick like 1962? or 1973, mm -hmm. it, then there would not have been any external reference that might be troubling, you know, but why pick post-war? That, that's, that was really my point. Yeah, I, I didn't expect you to write a war novel. That, that wasn't my point. No, yeah, no, I think this is symptomatic that he was sort of in a coma for decades. Ah. So all this outside was not real to him. He was oblivious to it and he was coming out of his coma towards the end of the book, is, is how I read that. That's a really good point, Stephen. Yeah. Can I ask you, one of my questions was, what do you think about the psychiatrist uh, from beginning to end? How do you see this development? What do you think about it? 
looked like he was in a block of ice. And the ice was starting to melt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice metaphor, Heidi. <laughs> I thought of him as being very sad at the beginning and not very proficient at his work yes. as a, a therapist. I wouldn't want to have him as my therapist, yes. but by the end, I was more hopeful for him. So at first, not really liking him very much. Mm -hmm. And then as he worked his way through the story, I understood him a little bit more. And by the end, I was feeling hopeful for him. But yeah. Heidi... What do you, yeah, because I'm, okay, so here's the Danish thing. I've never seen a psychiatrist. I've never seen a psychologist. I've never talked to a counselor. I've never had any help. <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> that I'm, I'm absolutely fine. But my point is how, what do you expect from this kind of psychiatrist? What do you expect from professional counseling? I think it's really different now than it was then. And uh, perhaps uh, the way he was taught was just to have someone lie on a couch and maybe people do that today. Uh, and then you don't really make contact with them and just yeah. um, probably just to make comments like he did, like, mm, you know, yeah, just right. make noises, that kind of thing. But I, I come from a family with psychiatrists and clinical psychologists and uh social workers who are doing clinical work and 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 I have a therapist and so I just think of it very differently I think of it as uh, more humanizing <laughs> than what he was doing so I he was uh, drawing pictures of birds and mm. yes and I and I kind of got a feel for you know in in the interview that you had Desiree I was understanding a little bit more about why the author did that and I, but I just thought, oh my gosh, I wouldn't last long with that person. <laughs> so, I don't but know. Did he, no, but that's so interesting to me because did you all think that he helped her? Did he help his other clients? Well, when he told the woman, okay, stop, you know, stop just uh, thinking about all those details in your life that are ruining your life and think about the ma things that matter, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, basically. And what, when he said to the other one, you have to do something, you can't just expect other people. I mean, all of a sudden, it seems like to me, he's taken an initiative. Is yeah, that but, that, you... but, that, but that is not what psychiatry or psychoanalysis is about in my experience. I've been analyzed um, by Wolfgang Pappenheim, whose mother was analyzed by Freud. That is to say, they sit there, you lay on the couch or sit in a chair, and they go, and that means what? They never, he, to me, when he said that about uh, you've got to do this, he was blowing his stack. He was absolutely blowing his stack in frustration um, mm -hmm. because psychiatrists never get to that point. Now, social workers, psychologists, yes, they may interact with you and tell you something about yourself and try to help you with behavioral contexts and things to do, but psycho psychoanalysts and psychiatrists never. They say almost nothing. And you wonder, why am I paying all this money? But in my experience, I got rid of all my migraine headaches. So it did me some good. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> What's, what do you expect them to do? I mean, are they just supposed to sit there and listen? So you could just as well be talking to a pillow? No, they guide you. They'll say a word and all of a sudden it opens up some kind of closed door that you weren't even aware of. Just ah. their, their, the word, a trigger word they'll say because they know where you're coming from, unless they're so busy, like, you know, uh, copying the Mona Lisa or writing, you know, scribbles or birds, but um, really trained analysts will take up your thread and ask a leading question. And then all of a sudden you'll see a, a, a whole different horizon. It'll take you to a different place or you'll leave the session. Generally, if it's a great analyst, you'll leave the session and you'll think, what just happened? And by the time you go back, which is usually the next day or every other day, then you have more to talk about. And to, the, to my experience, uh, my analyst told me to wake myself up every two hours and, and jot down in a notebook my dreams that this was very important. So, so we have dreams. All right. Yeah. Okay. 
can I ask you all, what do you think is Agatha's problems? What are her problems? Her I father think- abused her sexually. That doesn't help. Did he? No. Oh. Maybe she did feel that. He was blind, wasn't he? But even yeah, if you have a blind father, you don't, expect to be, yeah. you don't expect to be felt up by your father, I don't think. It's mm-hmm. not normal. An interest, no, it's an interesting point because it really matters on, I would say it matters with the eyes that read because I mm-hmm. read that like three times and I thought, oh, but he's not sexually abusing her. He's seeing her yeah. with his hands. So there's, that's the other side. So that is that is interesting. But, but she that, did, but she did thought, say that she she has done more to her than her sister, though. Yeah, and she mm-hmm. said that she felt um, assaulted more yeah. or less by that. Mm-hmm. Heidi, what were you going to say? I was just not anything different, um, but just that I. It was in. It was her feelings that mattered. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know what her dad's intent was, and we can't know. Um, because it isn't ever, you know, revealed anywhere in the story, but it just seems like she felt violated. Yeah. And, and that is the most important part is that she right. feel, she felt as though she had been, um, yeah, uh, violated and she didn't, yeah. she just and her had mother a, didn't protect her. Her mother didn't yes. protect her. Yeah. See, no, I have a very, a, a, a comment on that because when my sister and I were both little, we would go to my mother's cousin's house, who was not far away, and her husband would tickle us, okay? Mm. And we'd be screaming, stop, stop, stop. And neither of our parents said anything about it. And it was, I wouldn't say that I felt violated. I felt unprotected. My sister remembered it to this day. And it's, mm. I think that's a kind of old fashioned thing where you don't, the parents don't comment they, they don't even want to think about that might be sexually motivated. So it's just kind of brushed aside. And mm-hmm. But you end up, as Agatha did, feeling very betrayed by your, well, by her uh, her mother. You feel very betrayed. And I, I think he, it, it was a sexual intrusion on his part. I, I would mm-hmm. say most definitely that it was, considering the effect that it had on her. And I, it was inappropriate. Yeah. Can we go deeper and and say, does she have other problems or does everything stem from these unfortunate events in her childhood? How do you see any other problems? She's married. Well, that's it. She said, Julian and I have, um, what did she say? An arrangement or um, I don't remember how she put it, but it sounded like something other than um, a loving relationship. Let's put it that way. And she had an issue of being seen, hence the dreaming of the telescope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that thing about being seen, how do you see that as a theme? And I wanted to, in my questions also, and very much in my own thoughts, link that to getting older and his feelings of being invisible and general feeling of invisibility as you get older, because you're not relevant, you're not important. And you can say, okay, does she feel that she's relevant? Does he feel he's relevant? And to whom and why? And is that why he bakes the cake, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of themes there. Any takers to those questions? Well, I had another point before that when he finally breaks through and started saying things to his patients, He's saying this, he's saying it to himself. Mm-hmm. He's, he's giving himself the advice as he's giving it to his patients. So, yeah. But if you surround yourself with a feeling of invisibility or a wall of invisibility or any kind of harness, is that because you're trying to protect yourself from being hurt? You know, again, that if I never loved, I never would have cried. Or is it simply because you feel that you're irrelevant? And is that irrelevance part of his desire to retire? And I want to finish. I don't want to get engaged. I want to stay outside. And then I want to retire and do, oh, oh, by the way, what? 
he sits and watches a little girl fall down. He doesn't do anything about it, etc. What kind of life is it that he's actually getting? And is he creating his own invisibility? Again, you know, what about in the beginning? In the beginning, he's very disengaged. He he's in very, the very disengaged. Of the book, but Linda, in the beginning, he was writing down, listen like this, do this, do that, taking notes about all his patients, being engaged. What happened? And it seems to me that that's a wall. It's a wall against the terrors of, of what existence is. Okay, I can say from my own experience, <clears throat> my wall is learning Danish, right? When I begin to think about life and death, I immediately study Danish grammar or Icelandic grammar, which is even more obscure. And then I just go on and feel like my life is, has meaning and is happy. And I feel that he was doing the same thing by making lists, by figuring things out. It's just like a wall against the torrent, which is life. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve, when, you go by, when are you going to write your book? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm too busy learning Danish. I'm not writing any book. Maybe I'll write a book in Danish. Oh. <laughs> any other comments on this? Invisibility? I'm just, yeah, I'm, just, I'm wondering about the term being relevant, if that's on his mind, because that would mean that he cares. Right? He cares about himself being relevant. He cares about himself in the world and it's opposed to other people and at mm -hmm. least in the beginning i don't get a sense of that at all that in invisibility is not it as a way i read it at least directed at someone or something it's more like an inner thing and not until the two women <laughs> on the stage um does he start to relate to the world that is outside himself, uh, himself. That's at least how I, I read the book, not even with his patients. Or his secretary, Cindy? Uh, yeah, I was um, just recalling that when, um, the, when Agatha first came to him, she said something that implied to me that he must be quite renowned in his field. I think she said, I researched and, you know, you're the best and you're the one I want, um, which yeah. to your, to your question, you just asked, he did start out, you know, with so much enthusiasm, wanting to be, a, you know, have a meaningful career and a meaningful impact. And I think there's something woven in there. So I think he did achieve success in his career, but it was obviously not in, in, um, you know, parallel with happiness in life. And so there's something there about you know what is happiness and in the end he would he they described him waking up and his first thought was oh I have no idea how many on my list oh and mm -hmm. I'm under this lovely comforter oh and I smell the tea and it was kind of like he'd gone through this arc of eager student successful but miserable psychologist and then just you know, a human who's enjoying the simple things in life. Um, so, so I, I saw that tie to, um, you know, how you, how you define life and how you define success and happiness. Can I add to that? Well, Cindy, oh, I'm sorry. I, I have to ask you what happens when he starts throwing up, falling down mm -hmm. on the street, uh, having panic attacks, how does that, you know, fit into that theory of him actually moving towards a better life with more engagement? Yeah. It's like a chicken and uh, breaking out of its shell. Yeah. Okay. The, the little chicken is breaking the shell and the pain of breaking the shell. But to me, he has emerged uh, as a better, well, better, that's subjective, but a more complete person towards the end, especially one of the key points with uh, Madame Sorug that she he actually goes and helps her husband he doesn't want to but he does it that was a real crack in the shell and the cake a crack in the shell and to me when he fell down and was so disoriented that was like the beginning of or uh, awakening and wading into the lake 
Yeah, wading into the lake. And being in the lake with his clothes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, also, and, and his grocery is still in his hands, it seemed like. Yes. <laughs> and to Cindy's point, I mean, I just love that, like, we hear in the beginning how academically gifted he was, right? But he's very detached as a human being. There is no connection between his intellect and his, like, emotions. But to me, it, I love the picture of where he's like, he's been to the bathroom, he's washing his hands, he wants to look in the mirror and there is no mirror and he has no face. And then, oh, there is no mirror in this bathroom, right? And that's kind of, um, yeah. I think it ties in with what Cindy just said, that there is no connection. Like he is all brain, but there is no human, like there's no humanity or no emotions, no depth, no reflection. Uh, to other people's emotions yeah. or to his own. And he's got his, his strict routine. And if something oh. changes that, it gets all discombobulated. What about his parents? There is a chapter called Cleaning Up. How did you see that? I mean, he throws out basically everything uh, without a thought. He's obviously not a hoarder. He's been living unconsciously without yes. choosing it with yeah. these things around him for his entire life and all of a sudden he says okay i am now making maybe a subconscious choice and throwing it all out even pictures on the wall mm -hmm. that were painted by his dad mm -hmm. hmm. how do you how do you feel about that is that part of a necessary because you know you can see it part of a necessary cleanup inside or outside yourself downsizing whatever you want to call it finding yourself when you throw out all the knickknacks and all the unnecessary things around you or is he just completely overreacting to his own feeling of well swimming in a lake quite, <laughs> quite kind of metaphorically I think, I think he was in with Eve. Yeah, I think it fits in with Eve's uh, eggshell idea. I don't yeah. think Bre I could hear what out. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> Stephen. Stephen, would you repeat it, please? Oh, okay. Eve was describing this as he's fitting out of his eggshell. And I think this is part of the breaking through the eggshell. Yes. And, and I'm sorry, it's because purge, a purge. That's why. Mm -hmm. Yes, Linda, what were you saying? Yeah, he was having a purge. Yeah. Purging the the past and hoping that now in the, the purging of the past, there was a creation of, of something. Something that uh, I, I guess finishes up with him going into the cafe or wherever with Agatha. Reaching Can out, I purging and reaching out. Can I go back then to what you were saying and talking about before, namely the fact that you found, Linda, you said that you found the relationship with the psychiatrist and his patient in the book, not real, but yeah. does she, does Agatha help him? Does he help her? Do they help each other? Yeah, yeah. Ag she, Agatha helps him, actually. Mm -hmm. Agatha actually becomes the analyst in a way. Mm -hmm. Yes, she helps him. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I think that uh, Madame Sorug helps him. That is a pivotal point. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because we have, uh, Cindy, you were going to say something. We had uh, how, you know, the feeling about there's something lonely about not living. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I was just going to comment. I mean, the book is Agatha, named Agatha, and has a lovely guy. But um, to me, if I really think about what was the most pivotal moment, it was when he went to uh, Thomas's bedside mm -hmm. and just, you know, when you're on the brink of death, that, that cuts, uh, cuts to the core of what's important. So if I am I trying to think of his evolution, for me, if it weren't for that, just if it were just his interaction with Agatha, I, I don't think there would have been the breakthrough. Mm -hmm. But Cindy, that really was a big question. I mean, I put it in here. Is it possible to be honest and direct with others without the presence of death? 
because here death is introduced and Thomas says, do you know death? And he says, no, I don't. I recognize that I don't. But of course, the big question also, if you need a psychiatrist, if you use a psychiatrist, any kind of therapist, that honesty, that directness, that closeness, how do we obtain that? How do we reach other people? I, my personal belief is you can be done in the, in the absence of, uh, you know, on the brink of death. And um, yeah. a lot of it is just, you know, your life view and how you think about how you're connected to other people, your curiosity about life and wanting, I mean, even people in a book club almost already by default have an essence of what is key, which is wanting to put yourself in other people's shoes yeah. and feel yeah. their lives and just be curious about that you know, and that doesn't have to be about death, but I think that's a step to, you know, being, being close and building connections to other people. But that's such an interesting question, Lee, about the honesty, because I think um, for those of us who've tried therapy, we think we go into that room and that we are being honest, or sometimes we're trying to cover things up to look better, but the whole process of being in therapy and having things unraveled will change your perception of what the truth is, what your mm -hmm. truth is, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. that's, it's super interesting that we think we're telling the truth. We think we're living our truth. But if we dare to go into that room and have someone else question our truth or, or poke holes in, in maybe some of the things we don't like to um, like think about or we can't, we're in a position where we, we can't deal with it or whatever, whatever, our truth will change by somebody else's means. Hmm. That makes sense. Makes sense to me, actually. Hmm. Yeah. And how does his truth change? What happens to him in his search for life and truth? And does he, okay, and to me, another pivotal moment is when he breaks down at the funeral of Thomas and cries. Mm -hmm. And a stranger's arms, the way she writes that, I thought was very powerful. A stranger's arms around him is comforting him. A stranger. And I don't think that before that moment, he would have... Uh, allowed that or accepted it but here it's actually comfort so again it kind of ties into my my question is it necessary to break down is it necessary to do the cleanup to do the purging in order to look at a new path in life to find that new path what would have happened if Agatha hadn't shown up on his doorstep what if Madame Suruk had not uh, had a husband who was dying? She wouldn't have written a book, right? Because there wouldn't have been anything. <laughs> it would have been uh, utterly boring. But, uh, but of course, again, uh, relating it to our own lives, do we all need to be shaken from time to time and reminded that life is not a dress rehearsal? You know, all those trite little things that we can go count your blessings and, mm -hmm. you know, think about the now and carpe diem. Ooh, you get quite exhausted from all this uh, good advice about how to live your life that you maybe don't have time to live your life if you have to think of the advice all the time. So how does she manage in her book to supersede that level of banality? Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy it? You know, did you enjoy the writing style? It seems like it all, it spoke to, to all of you. Does, does mm -hmm. anybody who hasn't said it so far would like to maybe say something? Nancy, Christy, would you like to jump in? Suzanne, and you didn't read it, but it's very, as you can see, very kind of everyday um, talk here. Yes, Christy. I I have to say that I just uh, ordered the copy of the book and received it last night, so mm -hmm. I have not read it. So I just came to hear what people had folk and folks had to say. I, I look forward to reading it. 
Good, good. Do you recognize any of the themes that we're talking about? Do they feel like they're relevant to you too? Well, they're they're traditional part of our literature repertoire, so absolutely. It's nothing unusual. <laughs> no, that's so true. <laughs> I have something, if I may speak. Yes, Nancy. Um, I, I thought uh, the um, metaphor um, with the walls and the mirrors and um, even the chapter title pains um, was very significant. And I thought it all tied in very nicely to his imagining that he was having these interactions through the wall with his neighbor who ultimately then was not having the same experience. He was a deaf mute. And so um, he thought, you know, the other guy was um, kind of connected to him in this way with the sound through the walls. And then that proved to be um, totally not true at all. So I thought that was probably quite eye opening for him. So um, I, I really enjoyed the book and um, the ending I thought was very interesting. Um, does he retire? Uh, I, I think if he does not retire, he would certainly change his ways a little bit. Um, he did take to an extreme um, sort of, you know, uh, offering um, the response or the appropriate timing of a response that was not terribly um, connected to his profession, um, even though he said it was part of his training. Um, so, yeah. And you know what? It made me think of uh, a part in the book. I don't know if you thought about that in the beginning, you know, when that little girl falls out of the tree and he doesn't react and he said, oh, I want to go into the other room and hide and then later on she says hello to him in the street and that was such a revelation she took the initiative just like Agatha takes the initiative to ask him and saying says to him even when you are not sad you look sad doesn't matter you look sad all the time and uh, you're supposed to be helping me not be sad so um, it seems as if other people People have to take the initiative. Madame Surik asking him to talk to Thomas, Thomas talking to him, the stranger in the church, and then gradually, and uh, with, of course, your um, analogy, Linda, he's also a snail, right? Very, very slowly crawling out of his protective house, uh, trying to find maybe his own feet in, in reality and in real life. I don't know if it's possible. And that? For me, this book was about invisibility. And I guess the older I get, the more I understand invisibility. Um, my friends and I often talk about the fact that we don't seem to be seen anymore. The older we get, the grayer our hair gets. Um, and what we have to say doesn't seem to be as important anymore. So as I read this book, to me, it was him becoming visible as I went through the book. And I think that scene with a little girl, when she went past him and said hello to him, I think all of these things were suddenly realizing that he wasn't invisible anymore. I think he nurtured that invisibility, but I also think he was in a way warring against it. So for me, it was a very hopeful book because he was old, he was retired. Um, he. He did what I did. I made a chain with 150 links in it and broke one every day until I retired. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that, um, I think it was a very positive, upbeat book. And at the end, I don't think it matters if he goes on or he doesn't go on. He's visible again. Oh, those should have been the last words in it. That's so, <laughs> so wonderful. Okay, I may I ask? Oh, I'm sorry. Is I'm just going to say I that really convinced me. Um, I was reluctant to take a chance on on the book because I thought that the descriptions of it that I read were not pretty, were not very enlightening, and were, weren't very interesting at all. It was rather made it sound rather superficially, as a matter of fact. And I was just reluctant to go out and spend money on a book that I thought I might not be able to read because the print wasn't big enough. 
I don't know why I didn't find the Danish Kindle edition, but I didn't find the Danish Kindle edition. Now I will find the Danish Kindle mm -hmm. edition. And I will also recommend the book to the Scandinavian book group here in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So thank oh, you. Wonderful. Thank you all for sharing. Oh, okay. wonderful. Can oh, I just, I, if you get this print, guys, can you see it? If you get this print, it's pretty big. Um, like, oh my gosh, you can't see anything. I'm it's sorry. You're, yeah, it's, you're, it's, you're, I can't oh, even see your name, but if you tell me that it's pretty big, that helps. Yeah, I mean, if you get that this, does help, you know. this version is very big. I have a bad eyesight as well. And and this I can read without having like tired eyes. So yeah. that's why I highly recommend that one. Thank you. <laughs> can I go back to you and ask, uh, because you're saying something that really makes me think, why did you feel that way? Why did you feel that because of gray hair, um, age, you were not interesting to other people you were not being listened to why do you th think that was yeah i was talking to you annette you muted yourself okay you muted. wait a minute she's talking to me yeah well when i when we discuss it as friends we have similar experiences and i they're very superficial experiences but for example i go to the grocery store and i'm standing in the deli and I've been standing there for five minutes waiting for somebody to notice me. And another young person walks up and they're waited on immediately. And it's like, wait a minute, I exist. I'm here kind of thing. And those kind of things seem to happen to you more as you get older. Or when there's a discussion with a group of young people. Now, when I worked, I worked. Well, by the time I retired, everybody I worked with, I was the age of their grandparents. So they were young. <laughs> And when I worked, I kept, I dyed my hair. And the minute I stopped dyeing my hair, I began to notice they didn't pay as much attention to what I had to say about something. And most of the support I did for people was over the phone where they can't see you. Mm -hmm. But when I started meeting some of those people and they saw my age, I did not have the authority that I had when they didn't know how old I was. So I don't think it's something that we imagine. I think that there is a part of becoming older where you become less important in the world. You have to fight harder not to do that, I think. And, you know, and when you talk, people will talk over you. I mean, a lot of this stuff happens. So when my friends and I talk about this issue, we talk about, well, what are we going to do about this? And, you know, why, when we walk up to that deli, we're going to have to make more noise or whatever. But uh, I don't think it's something I've made up. I think it's a real thing. Oh, I agree with you 100%. And I agree with you. I uh, retired from a faculty position at a university and where students would sit on the edge of the seat and take notes and listen to me. Once I was retired out of it, it was like, move it along, old person. I don't want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> you know? I'm amazed. I don't feel that way at all. Right. I, I, I mean, there's certain kind of attention that you don't get anymore as you get older. You don't get attention from young men, obviously. But other than that, I guess I just have a really kind of explosive personality. And I I never feel unnoticed. I mm -hmm. sometimes feel I could get less attention than I do, but I've, I've never felt invisible. I, I, you know, I mean, I believe what you're saying. I'm not denying the reality of, of oh, no. your, different experiences, different experiences. But I, you know, I don't feel that way. That's, it's odd, you know. No. I mean, Elizabeth, yes? No, I was just, I turned 85 last week. And wow. I really don't feel I've gotten yeah. invisible. I mean, the one thing I thought with everybody wearing masks mm -hmm. that I thought, you know, in a way, I look much more attractive with the, because <laughs> I always hated my nose and my nose is so misshapen. And I thought, yes. people would, you know, I think, jeepers, I'm going to miss not wearing a mask. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you completely. Yes, I know the feeling. Well, you know, you know, the mask made us look at eyes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And, and I thought, wow, there's some really pretty eyes out here. Yeah. 
Another thing I ask pertaining to this question we're discussing here is if everything is just repetition. There's so many things in this book that make life seem like it's not worth living. Okay, so it's Agatha cutting herself and trying to commit suicide in various ways and anorexia and so on. But then on the other hand, we're also trying to focus on the hopeful things, everything that does bring hope. But there is at some point in the book where he says everything is just repetition. We do the same things over and over. We yeah. never develop. And yet the book contradicts that. And I think that that's mm -hmm. interesting. That might also apply to our lives. Sandra? No, I agree with you. Yeah. So maybe repetition and routines are good enough. We just can't have only repetition yes. and only routine maybe another thing that the, the book is also showing us and I mean the in, like we we're saying here it doesn't really matter what the ending of the book is because what the book has done all along is make us think and I think mm -hmm. that it makes us think about life and death and aging and being young and being unhappy as a young person she doesn't have any children she didn't have a nice childhood. Mm. It doesn't seem like she has a nice marriage. What is nice in her life? She has friends that she laughs with at the cafeteria. That's all we know about her. And what is nice in his life? And so it's really difficult, I think, to focus on the nice things because it seems like this porridge of uh, indifferent everyday occurrences yeah. Yeah. are drowning them. And they're just kind of swimming in this mud, if you will. Anyway, so they're they're just they're just uh, other thoughts. And of course, another theme is having someone to talk to. So this is a big question for me: Is there a difference between talking to friends and family if you have problems, and talking to somebody who's a professional? Yeah. Oh and yeah. Who you're married to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, mm. but I also think that um, no matter whether you have had a long life with a professional career in a field that is like academic and prestigious, or you have had a life where you have had some missed opportunities like Agatha, Agatha um, and feel like you should have done more with what you had and you have many emotional issues, the question mm -hmm. is, how does one do life in a way where when we retire, we can maybe both look forward to what we have left and backwards, like how did I, how do I do life in a meaningful way? And what does that mean to the individual? Mm -hmm. And I think that's also what she touches on in this book, um, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What is it to live? When you is get right down to it, this book is a journey. This book is, it takes us on a journey, I yeah. think. And uh, one thing in her writing technique that really helped me to continue with it was how short the chapters were. Mm -hmm. So even oh if God. there was a point of frustration mm -hmm. and I don't know about this book, well, the chapter was over and on to something new. And yeah. I thought that was very clever on her mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Oh, I'm sorry. Who was saying something? Yes, Heidi. Yeah. In relation to the comment that you just made about short chapters, one thing that I learned in um, the interview with her is that sometimes she only had a little bit of time to write. And so she would just write what she could. And then that would be the end of the chapter. And then she'd go on to another one. So she had bits of time. And she had to be um, able to, I think, consolidate her thoughts and write them down. And Can you buy that, though? I don't know after she answered that. I'm like, maybe she's being typical Danish. See, she is a bit. Like, her, like, she's a very smart woman, right? I mean, do you yeah. buy it? Maybe she was being a bit uh, facetious. I guess I thought that maybe there were lots of time constraints for her. And absolutely, she absolutely. But yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know her, her other books well enough to know that what her style is, but I think she was more being more humble than she, oh. I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm just questioning everything. 
<laughs> but but I we have to, and and I think that that's what this book does. And uh, I did ask you about existentialism. I mean, existentialism, of course, because uh, Søren Kierkegaard, the Dane, mm -hmm. is the father of existentialism. But there's a lot about choices in there. However, the one thing that Kierkegaard said is that before you can even make choices, you have to exist. So uh, before you can kind of go into his three faces of the aesthetic and the ethic and the religious, you actually have to exist as a person. And I think if I may, may round it off, because we're running out of time, mm -hmm. but that's what this book has done for me. It has made me think about existing and the choices we make every day to exist in a meaningful way, in a meaningful interrelationship or interaction or community with others and also to exist with ourselves in that solitude that he also treasures. So there's so many things there that the book made me think about not yeah. and i think you're right christy when you say it's totally normal everyday literary matters but you can write them in such a way that you sit back and say oh that wasn't so bad <laughs> with those words i thoroughly enjoyed all your comments please come back Next time, we're going to read a funny book. Ha <laughs> ha. That's the Christmas present. It's actually funny. It's also about uh, being very Danish. And um, it's called The Land of Short Sentences, yeah. which is a very, very literal uh, translation of the Danish book. But it is good. It's not very long. And it's a young author. And I think she has a lot to say also about life and existence, not in quite as maybe uh, existentialist way as as this one but thank you so much all of you for being here and thank you to Tova for officiating and making everything work and I hope to see you again next yeah. month bye thank you bye. thank you bye. 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 thank bye. you